What's going on my friends? This is Dustin Stelzer with Electrician U and today we're gonna to talk about EMT. So what is EMT? EMT is a type of tubing. Uh, it's electrical metallic tubing. Really it's a conduit, we, we all call it conduit, but more accurately it is a tubing, not a conduit. It's a thin walled steel tubing. Uh, it does come in other flavors, so there's a stainless uh, version of it, there's an aluminum version of it, but mostly what everybody's using is the steel version. Uh, you go to Home Depot or go to a supply house and buy it. But essentially EMT is just a raceway. It's something for you to pass wires through. So let's talk about some uses in the NEC that are permitted for EMT. Um, it can be used in exposed or concealed environments. So that means like you can run it down a wall exposed or it can be concealed behind walls. Um, it can also be put in concrete or direct buried into the earth, but you have to have specific kinds that can handle that. Um, the earth is very corrosive to metals. So you need to have uh, either a stainless or galvanized to be able to do that. Um, if you're gonna use regular aluminum EMT, that stuff over time is gonna corrode and it's gonna break and moisture is gonna get inside and that it's gonna be ruined. So what are the uses that are not permitted for EMT? Um, basically, anywhere that you use EMT, it can't be somewhere that is subject to physical damage. So if something is going to hit that conduit that has any possibility of crushing it um, or something that's really, really corrosive, it's going to damage it. So you can't use it in any environment where it's gonna get damaged. You also can't use EMT to support luminaires or other fixtures. So sometimes you'll see somebody like ran some EMT underground and the, the conduit is sticking up and they put a box on it and put a plug in it. And you can grab that thing and wiggle it and pull it out of the ground. You can't do that. It's gotta be, um, there's gotta be something supporting the conduit. The conduit cannot be the support for a box or a piece of equipment. In 358.14, it talks about dissimilar metals. And this is really important because anytime you have different metals, you are always gonna have one that's a little bit more active and a little bit more passive, meaning one's gonna kinda of act like a, an anode and one's gonna act like a cathode in a battery. And if you were to touch those things together, the more passive um, metal is gonna corrode the more active one, meaning the more active one's gonna start giving up material, giving up uh, electrons, and it's gonna start reducing. And so eventually it reduces enough to separate the connection or it reduces enough to completely like break apart, break down. So when you're using things like aluminum uh, tubing, aluminum EMT, aluminum is a very, very active substance. So it will degrade when you introduce it with other metals. So you gotta be careful what kind of straps you're using and what kind of couplings, fittings, everything that you're using. It does say in code that you can use steel fittings on aluminum and you can also use aluminum fittings on steel. But it's, it very clearly says if you're using stainless, only use stainless fittings. And the cool thing about stainless is stainless steel doesn't rust easily. It still does rust and there's a lot of different reasons, oxygen, chloride, uh, things, especially when you're close to the ocean that will cause it to rust. Um, but if you, if you have a material that you're using, a metal that will rust really easily mixed with stainless, the rust from that normal metal, that zinc or that you know steel or whatever you're using, the rust getting on the stainless, if there's any inconsistencies in the amount of chloride or any kind of like holes where moisture can build up, that rust will start to rust away at that stainless. So it's really important when you're using stainless steel to only use stainless steel um, or to use something that is approved for stainless steel use uh, that's not gonna be so caustic on it. Uh, 358.20 talks about the sizes. There actually are approved sizes because there's other thin walled metal tubing that are used for other reasons. So you can't also use those as conduit. You have to use um, specifically something that is either half inch in diameter on the small side or four inch in diameter on the large side. You can't just take a, a six inch metal pipe and call that EMT because it is tubing and it is uh, metallic or aluminum or stainless. You have to stick to these specific sizes that it lists in the NEC. Uh, 
in 358.24 and 26, it talks about the bending radius, and not really the radius, but more specifically just the bends. Um, when you bend EMT, there is a certain point where you can kink that conduit or you can damage the conduit. So you can't over bend, you can't damage the conduit. And then uh, more specifically, there's a certain amount of bends that you can put in conduit. So you have to account for all of the bends that you're making. And from one box or termination to another box or termination or pull point, um, you can't have more than 360 degrees in bends. And the list says you not being able to have more than four one quarter bends, but I think that language is a little silly um, because there's all kinds of offsets and, and kicks and things that people can put in conduit, but it pretty much means 490s. Can't have more than 490s because 90 plus 90 plus 90 plus 90 equals 360 degrees. Um, and you're gonna find out if you do that, it's gonna be hard to get any wire pulled through it. It's hard just to get a fish tape through something that has five or six different bends. So make sure that your buttons, uh, that you're sticking within 360 degrees, that's code. 358.28 covers reaming. So when you have a piece of conduit that is a whole stick of conduit, that 10 feet, you buy it from Home Depot or wherever, you don't have to ream the ends of that conduit. But once you make a cut, you start burring the new uh, edge of that conduit so you need to ream it out in some way there's not a specific way there's no special tools that you have to use although there are tools that people make Klein makes a screwdriver um, that kind of look looks like a unibit or a stepped bit and you can sit and ream the end of it and it takes the outer and inner burr of the ins of that uh, conduit and it smooths them out and makes it so you're not gonna run wire across a really rough and, and uh, sharp surface so you have to do reaming of some sort somehow a lot of people will take their needle nose and they'll stick the needle nose on the inside and they'll ream it out. Some people take um, channel locks and go around the outside and do it. It doesn't matter how you do it. But when you start reaming your conduits, um, you always want to reach your finger on the inside and just feel and see if it still feels sharp. And then the outside too. The outside doesn't matter as much, but it does once you start trying to put couplings over that. Um, so you need to ream the outside too. But more importantly, they're talking in the code about reaming the inside of the pipe. There's even like drill bits that you can get where it, it kind of again looks like a unibit or a step bit and you just run that thing on the, the inside of that conduit and it cleans it so it's not sharp anymore. But that's what the code is talking about when it says reaming. 358.30. Let's talk about securing and supporting a little bit. So this is 358.30. Uh, it talks about where you need to strap and secure conduit when you're hanging it. So uh, there's, a, as the general rule of thumb is 10 feet, every 10 feet you need to have a strap or within 10 feet. Um, but if you're coming from a box or a panel and you're like coming into it within three feet of that box, panel, termination, any kind of thing that you're terminating the end of that conduit run, within three feet of that you have to strap and securely support that conduit. Um, but then after that, every 10 feet, no more than 10 feet, you can do every three feet, doesn't matter, but you just can't exceed 10 feet or else what you'll start noticing is that conduit's gonna start bending or bowing or if somebody like tries to I don't know, stand on it or like push on it, um, it can pull off the wall. So you gotta make sure that you're really putting as much effort as you can into strapping conduit securely. Now there are two exceptions to this in code. Uh, say that you have conduit that you're fishing down behind something that you can't access. Obviously you can't access it, you don't have to strap it. You know, you're not gonna be able to reach your hand and your drill down inside of a wall and strap that conduit. So that's a, a time where you wouldn't need to support it. You need to support all the way up until that point, but even if you're like fishing across a portion of an attic or something like that, you can strap it on one side, strap it on the other side, but you can't get in the middle, it's okay to do that. Um, the second thing is if your building or structure that you're attaching your conduit to, does not allow for you to strap within three feet of a termination, you can go to five feet. All right, so 358.42 talks about couplings and connectors. And the big rule with couplings and connectors, when you're connecting two pieces of conduit together, or when you're terminating one piece of conduit into a box, is that they have to be made up tightly. So. I see a lot of people that will put couplings on and they'll like have 10 sticks of conduit and they'll put one coupling on each side and then they'll get up on a lift or whatever ladder 
and they're sticking one piece of conduit in and then they secure it and then they go and they stick another piece of conduit in because they've already got all the couplings made up but then they never go back and secure all the screws so couplings some of them have uh, two screws some of them have four screws but you have to make sure that every single screw if you're doing like a set screw style coupling is tight all of them have to be tight or if you're using weatherproof couplings you have to make sure that you take channel locks and tighten both sides of that thing so it doesn't move and so it's not loose and a big reason for that a there's more in code where the entirety of conduit has to be a complete system it can't you can't have conduit that's like separated by three inches and you can see the wire it has to be a complete system but even more the reason is emt can be used as an equipment grounding conductor what this means and this a long time ago this was a more of a prevalent thing but you can run a hot and neutral inside of a piece of conduit and not run a ground you can use the conduit itself as a, an equipment ground but in order to do that that path all the way from the equipment all the way back to the panel has to be solid in one piece so the only way that you can get away with doing that is making sure every single coupling and connector is tight otherwise you're not going to have continuity between that piece of equipment and the conduit all the way back to the panel um, so that's the purpose behind that. So that's the gist of it. That is EMT in a nutshell. Thank you guys so much for watching. I appreciate your attention and I will see you on the next one.